Do the Habs have the right players in place for this rebuild? We'll talk about this and more on Hockey Inside Out. Hello, welcome to another episode of Hockey Inside Out. I'm your host, Jessica Rusnak. Joining me this week are the usual suspects. We've got Stu Cowan from the Montreal Gazette. We've got former NHLer, Stanley Cup champ, and former assistant coach with the Montreal Canadiens, Rick Green. And we've got independent hockey analyst, Andrew Berkshire, joining us this week. Now, back in the heydays when the Montreal Canadiens were winning cup after cup, they had a lot of veteran players on their team with just a few rookies sprinkled in here and there. Now... It's kind of the opposite. It's a team pretty much full of rookies with a few veterans. Do you think that it's possible to build a Stanley Cup winning team with this kind of combination? Rick, since you were on one of those teams, uh, let's get you to start us off. Yeah, you know what? Uh, you know, it's times have changed. Uh, I mean, all the teams are a lot younger now, obviously. And uh, I, I think it's still really important to try and find the right veteran players to fit in to help these these young kids because they're veteran players for a reason because they've done a lot of things well for a period of time and I think it's uh, it's really important that they're around to show some of these kids the type of things and details that they need to do to uh, to make the difference in the NHL and um, yeah like I said it's it's different lots of kids that are you know trying to learn and, and figure out what they need to do. Uh, but you know, good veterans put as many winners as you can in the room. And I think that, uh, you know, bottom line there is everybody's going to follow suit. So it's not easy to do with, you know, uh, the restriction on the salaries, but I think it's really important to have good chemistry and, and a good mix between, you know, veteran guys that have been around to show those younger guys, uh, some of the tricks of the trade. It's, it's reverse of what it used to be, and that's the salary cap. The entire everything in the NHL today revolves around the salary cap. You know, you look back at those dynasty teams the Canadians had in the seventies. There's no way you'd be able to afford to keep the big three on defense with Ken Dryden and goal and Lafleur shut and uh, uh, Lemaire up front. You just wouldn't be able to do it. And you know, the modern day building of a team is get your draft well, young players with talent, lock them up young early, as the Canadians have done with Cole Caulfield and Nick Suzuki throw in a few veteran players and the Canes have, have done well with this new management team. The veterans, they like Sean Monaghan's not here anymore, but the impact he had on these young players will last for years and years and years. Same with Jake Allen talking with Jake Allen after a recent game. And he said, you know, he knows he's not going to be here when this team is at the point where it's ready to compete. But he says, I hope after I retire, I want to sit down on my couch, turn on the TV and watch these guys win a Stanley cup. So, and, and Mike Matheson, a younger guy. So they've really, the young group, they've surrounded them with some really good veteran guys that are, have an impact for a long time. And that's the way to go. I mean, right now the Canes are, are you know, year two of the rebuild. Uh, you know, it was years ago when Gila Fleur said, you know, they were a team with four fourth lines. <laughs> right now they basically have three fourth lines and one number one line. But the good thing is that number one line has been really effective. And the oldest guy on that number one line is Nick Suzuki at 24. So it's changed. I mean, people talk about, you know, uh, Oh, back in the day, it was Stanley Cup or nothing for the Canadians. Yeah, but 14 of their Stanley Cups came when it was a six-team league. And, you know, there was two playoff rounds. And then in the 70s, they won, you know, in the expansion year, when the best expansion team played in the Stanley Cup final, the St. Louis Blues made it the first three years and got swept all three years twice by the Canadians. So now, you know, just making the playoffs is an accomplishment in the 32-team NHL with a salary cap. And it's evolution, right? The Canadians, at some point, if this rebuild is successful... You know, six, seven years down the road, Nick Suzuki is going to be old. Cole Caulfield is going to be old. The younger defenseman will be old. And then it starts over again, right? Then you start getting rid of the older guys and rebuilding again. So it's, it's, a, it's just the way the NHL operates today. Yeah, it's a combination of the salary cap. And I think overall hockey has realized that younger players are better faster than, not necessarily than they used to be, but than they were recognized uh, to be earlier in their in uh, the NHL, right? It was it was a veteran-driven league. And in some cases, it still is. I think what Rick brought up with the, the veterans and, and Stu doubled down on, I think is really important. I think it's more important than ever because there are fewer veterans on these rebuilding teams that those veterans have to be great people. And I, I think I would liken it to, you know, like everyone who makes the NHL works hard, right? Uh, everyone who makes the NHL has talent, has a history of success in lower leagues, 
but it's like you can be the smartest kid in your high school. And then when you go to university, if you're not willing to put in that extra effort, you're going to fall behind real quick. Right. So in the NHL, it's a different game. It's more professional and you need those uh, veterans who have good habits to instill them in your young players. And I think the Canadians, like Stu said, have done a great job with that. I think guys like David Savard, uh, Mike Matheson, you can tell between the preparation that they put in uh, in the gym, between the attitude that they have during this rebuild. It's just been incredible for these young players. And I think it's a big part, along with the coaching staff, of why this team hasn't gone into these big, long funks, right? Like they, they lose a lot, but they don't lose seven, eight, nine, ten 10 games in a row. And they don't get down on themselves for extended periods. And I think that's going to be extremely important when they shift gears to get into a more competitive mode that they can take those lumps and kind of shake them off. Cause every team will always go through adversity to be able to handle that and continue putting forward your best is what separates the teams that are, you know, good, but never win uh, when it comes to the playoffs and the teams that maybe aren't as good in the regular season, but beat those teams consistently and upset teams in the playoffs. And I think that's what the Canadians uh, more than just uh, the roster building, they're trying to build that culture as well. And to my eye so far, it's been pretty successful. The other thing is like the leadership group, they're, they're fortunate to have Nick Suzuki as a captain at 24 years old, who does everything right on and off the ice. It's a reason why he hasn't missed the game since he came into the NHL. He takes care of his body on the ice or off the ice, on the ice. He's a hardworking guy. He's become turning into that sort of point per game player. And he's embraced Everything that comes with being captain of the Montreal Canadiens. You know, Shea Weber was a great leader in the locker room and the players loved him. But he, outside of the locker room, he didn't want to deal with the media. You hardly heard anything about him away from the rink. Compare that with Nick Suzuki, who the last two summers has basically lived in Montreal, apart from going home to London for a week or two. Uh, embraced the city, uh, around the fans, around the people, involved in local charities. He's embraced everything that comes with being captain of the Montreal Canadiens in the way that, you know, Yvonne Cornway did or John Bellevue and the great captains of the past. So he's only 24 years old. He's going to be here for a long time. And the Canadians made a smart decision when they named him captain. Uh, when when uh, Weber was named captain, I thought they should have named Brendan Gallagher because he also embra would embrace everything that comes with being captain of the Canadians. But when they named Suzuki, some people maybe want a Gallagher, but Gallagher – you know, it's not going to be here that much. He might be here too long for a lot of Canadians fans. But Nick Suzuki is the future of this team as far as leadership. So the Canadians management made a good decision when they put the C on his sweater. And I, I don't think it was that long ago when we think back at, uh, you know, rookies getting an opportunity to try and come in and play. And they had to have immediate impact because if not, they'd either be sitting on the bench or they wouldn't be playing the next game. And you know, just to show you how the youth has kind of taken over and the whole uh, way of dealing with this youth and the development is, uh, you know, put them in the, in the lineup, let them make mistakes, and we'll deal with all the stuff that comes with it. But years ago, really tough on uh, young guys trying to, to step into a, a, a veteran lineup and, uh, you know, make an impression, you know, sooner than later because uh, you wouldn't see another game. So... Uh, it's. I think it's obviously going in the right way because that's the way teams are formed now. And, you know, we're looking at long-term projects with these uh, good quality kids that, uh, you know, they're, they're hoping that they're going to be uh, come uh, bona fide NHL players. That's a huge difference, Rick, because I think the Canadians ruined a lot of their top prospects previously because they played scared. They knew if they made one mistake, they were either going to sent down or sit on the bench for the rest of the game. Remember Victor Mete when he left Montreal and went to Ottawa said, it's really hard to play when the coach is breathing down your neck constantly every time you come back to the bench. So Marty St. Louis has been put in the position by management that the pressure isn't to win now. So he's been given more freedom to allow guys to make mistakes and guys play free and know that if they make a mistake, they're not going to spend the rest of the game sitting on the bench. You know, Jaden Struble, I remember that game against San Jose when he made that really bad mistake behind the net, the puck went in front and they scored. Previous regimes, he would have sat on the bench probably the rest of the game and maybe not dressed the next game, but they threw him right back out there the next shift and he played well the rest of that game. So that's a huge change, I think, uh, within the Canadians' development philosophy that is really going to help them moving forward. You know, we talk about uh, the patience that they have, and maybe that's an advantage of being in a rebuild right now, and it might not always be this patient, but you can tell that there's going to be a bit more patience with young players through this coaching staff and this management group overall compared to what we're used to in Montreal. I always think of uh, Eunice Natanen, who was a Finnish prospect for the Canadians, not a high-end prospect back in the day, but he was called up from, I believe, Hamilton back in the day. 
and uh, Michel Therrien was the coach, and he played one shift. He was supposed to be like a face-off specialist, and I think he lost the face-off, and the Canadians were immediately scored on, and I believe his entire NHL career was about 11 seconds. They never got another shift. He was sent down right after. So I don't think we're going to see that type of situation, even for low-end prospects in Montreal. I think they're given more of a chance to shine and, and learn and grow, and that's what you have to do. I think every team that treats the NHL as not a development league is going to fall behind because from what you can see from St. Louis and Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon is every league is a development league. Even if you're a 30 year old player, if you're not developing, you're falling behind. If you're not adding things to your game, you're falling behind in the modern NHL. It's just too competitive. And the Canadians giving Marty St. Louis that freedom to let players make mistakes. I mean, Dominic Ducharme, after he was fired, basically said, you know, he wished he had had that freedom. Like he was coaching to win. Like he was coaching. He had to get this team into the playoffs. So he's, he was much more, you know, if a guy made a mistake, he, he punished them much harder because the pressure was on him to win. And it's not there with Marty St. Louis, at least not yet. And earlier this week, we got to hear from Kirby Doc after he was injured in the second game of the season. And uh, Martin St. Louis also spoke about, you know, how difficult of a situation this is for Doc uh, to, to have that kind of injury early on in the season. But he's been, you know, keeping him around the team, being part of team meetings, watching practice. Um, you know, how beneficial do you think it is to, to have him really be as close to the team as possible without being able to play? And how difficult uh, do you think it is for Kirby Doc to really have to watch all these games from the press box? Uh, Stu, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, I wrote a column this week. When you walk into the press box at the Bell Centre, if you look directly to your left, the first seat there is Kirby Doc's seat. <laughs> like, that's his regular, he's basically got a season ticket there uh, since he's come to Montreal. He's missed more games than he's played. And when you walk by him, it's like, it's, it's, it feels so bad for the guy. Like he's just sitting there game after game after game, watching his teammates and what they did, what Marty St. Louis did bringing him into the pre-scout meetings was really smart just to make him feel involved, give him something to do. I mean, doc was saying, you know, he had to arrive game days a lot earlier than normal because the meetings are early in the morning, but just to make him feel part of the team. And it says a lot about the coaching staff too, that they're willing to have input. Like it wasn't, he was just sitting there listening he was allowed to give his input and in what he thought on different things and i think that's huge with this coaching staff they're not just telling guys what to do they're telling them what to do but the players are allowed to say well maybe we should do this or i don't you know th there's a real good two-way conversation going on there and i remember last season asking marty saint louis where he ranked communication on the list of important things as a head coach in the nhl and without hesitation he said number one so this is just a, a case of making him feel involved with the team making him feel part of the team getting him to the arena earlier, you know, then you see him, he's always sitting on the bench watching the morning skates or the practices also. He's not with the team when they go on the road, which is really hard. You know, you're sitting at home alone. And, you know, so mentally, I think mentally more than physically, it's hard on guys when they're hurt like that. Rick, I don't know if you ever had a route that long, but it, it can't be easy just sitting and you're part of the team, but you're not part of the team, right? So by, by involving him in these meetings, he's made him feel part of the team. Yeah, you're right, Stu. Uh, you know, I had my sessions where, you know, injuries uh, became a big part of obviously not being able to contribute, but the, the psychological stuff that goes with it, because you're kind of alienated uh, to the point where you're kind of left on the outside. Uh, this was years ago. And, you know, people really should understand it's really challenging for guys to, uh, to, to keep their, you know, their mindset in a positive way when they're missing out on so much of, of their, their dream. And, uh, you know, it, it can be long. And when you get through, you know, long periods of time, like, you know, Kirby's dealing with, it's, uh, it's really challenging. So I think it's a real bonus that they have him around. They keep him in the mix. They keep him, you know, exposed to uh, the process of, uh, you know, what exactly Martin St. Louis wants to do how he wants to do it and um you know I, I always believe that you can learn a lot by watching it's not a, ideal but in, in this situation uh it's it's part of the game uh he's a he's a good kid he's 23 years old he's got lots to learn so you know keep him around i think it's great and uh you know the, the players probably like to see him because he's well liked and uh you know hopefully he'll uh He'll, he'll mend quick enough and get himself back in. But it's a real challenge for him psychologically. And uh, it's good to see them bringing him around and, uh, you know, making sure that they take care of uh, good people like he is. 
Yeah, and it folds back well into what we were just talking about, right? Development. Kirby Doc's not able to play. He's not able to partake in practices with the team, although he's starting to skate a little bit. But he's still developing on the mental side, as as Rick alluded to. You can learn things from watching. And he's still involved in the team adding in these concepts over time. You know, St. Louis has been big on concepts and adding slowly and then mastering a concept, then adding something else to it, driving into more detail. So even if he's not necessarily developing like the muscle memory and uh, the play style that St. Louis wants to develop, he's getting there mentally so that he's prepared when he comes back to jump right in. And, and while the other players aren't in these pre-scout meetings, at least now they have their own sort of eyes and ears in there. Right? I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're asking Kirby, like, what are those meetings like? Like what goes on? Who does what? So now it's, it's just that whole communication thing developing within this young team. Rick, how much more challenging is it when a player gets injured, like second game into the, into the season compared to, you know, like the 30th game, you know, what, what what's that like? Well, let's face it. It's, it's all, it all hurts. It all really plays on your 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 well being, if you will. You just you just want to play the game, and you want to you know you want to contribute. You want to be part of the team. Uh, you 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 have some assets, obviously, that are part of the team that you'd like to show. And when you get set back through injury, and you know you're not able to 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 jump in there, it's uh, it's it's not easy. And you know you got a lot of the guys and look at the guys over the course of the year that have been missing, you know, periods of time. And it's really pressing on their, their uh, well-being. And, uh, you know, the good news is they're, like we said before, they're, they're kept around and they're, uh, uh, they just have to, uh, you know, obviously get repaired from the, the problem that they have. And then they'll come back licking their chops ready to jump in there. But uh, it's not an easy time. And unfortunately, the Canadians have more uh, difficulty keeping everybody in the lineup uh, than than in, and uh, it, it's challenging. But uh, you have to uh, you you have to work your way through it. And um, you know they're they're good kids. Unfortunately, they've had some bad luck. It also depends on the injury a lot too, because like if it's your shoulder or your wrist, you can still skate, right? You can still. But when it's your knee, like with Doc, or I was talking with Alex Newark about this the other day, you know, he had the high ankle sprain. He said for six weeks, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't put any weight. He was walking on a boot and we'd see him going around the bell center in that little scooter. So he said, that was the hardest part. He says, as an athlete, you always want to be doing something to speed up that process about getting better, right? You want to, you want to do something. And he says that with a high ankle sprain, he couldn't do anything. And the same with Kirby Doc with a major knee surgery, he couldn't do anything. Now he's started to skate over the last few days just a little bit but that makes it even harder when you're just you literally can't do anything you're just you know, sitting there at home watching netflix or whatever and passing the time and the time must pass really slow and it's really challenging to you know pick up where they left off i mean they were you know they're playing well there, there's a lot of things happening and then now whoops you're you know you're trying to get your game condition your timing all this stuff and the expectation is uh, one of uh, okay, you're ready to go. Well, let's uh, pick up where you left off. But that's, that's why that's impressive what Newark's been able to do because six weeks of doing nothing, no skating, no running, no nothing, and, and to come back and play the way he has is really impressive. You know, and and doing all his drills uh, by himself or with somebody else, it's, it gets old after a while, especially for long term injuries. So, uh, anyways, it's it's part of it. The guys uh, have to stay focused, and uh, like I said, they they got some pretty good kids that. Uh, that have an idea of what they need to do and not do. The other thing Newark said that's tough too is when they go on the road, like the injured players stay behind for their treatments and that. And like, you know, on the road is fun lifestyle for these guys, right? Rick, you know, we're going out for dinners together. You're hanging out in the hotel, you're doing all that stuff. And they're not there. Like they're, they're at home sitting there by themselves. Although Newark said it's good because there's been other guys there. It's been that way for the last three seasons. If you're an injured Canadian, you have a lot of other guys you can hang out with at home while the team's on the road. All right, moving right along to rapid fire. Now there's only four teams in the NHL that have uh, fewer home wins than the Montreal Canadiens. What happened to home ice advantage? What is going on with this team whenever they play at the Bell Center? Why are they struggling in front of their fans that pay a lot of money to see them play? Andrew, what do you think? I, I'm going to be super boring and unsatisfying, and I apologize. It It's just random variants. They play pretty much the same as they do on the road. They have 11 wins at home and on the road. Uh, I think they're just not a great team, and they lose a lot. So that's just – it's a – 
simple, unsatisfying answer. It's just the way it is. I, I think it's the Bell Center is the best arena in the NHL to play in for the atmosphere, the sound and everything about it. And I think the visiting teams get fired up as much, if not more, than the Canadians. The Canadians do it 41 times a year. If you're one of the Western teams and you come here once a year, you're going to be pumped up. Or the other teams that play here once or twice a year. I think it's. I think that factors into it, especially if it's like a Saturday night. I think, I think playing at the Bell Center is really special, and I think visiting teams coming in feed off of that, and and that's one of the reasons. But they're also the Canadians aren't that great of a team. Is another reason, as Andrew said. Yeah, I mean, it's the coach's nightmare trying to figure out. Okay, how how can we get our act uh, going a little bit better? And it's it's really tough tough to pinpoint. And I mean, if you look at and the, if you look at years ago, um, the fans didn't give them one period before they were all over them if they weren't making things happen. So it's not like now that they're worried about making a lot of mistakes and getting booed. I mean, they, there has been occasion where they've come down a little bit on a few of the guys, but nothing compared to what it was before. But, you know, uh, unlike uh, other years, usually the visiting team would come into Montreal and, you know, as a home team, we would love it because we knew what they were doing the night before. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we've been there, done it. And, uh, you know, we were kind of licking our chops saying that they better be really good and playing guilty uh, because uh, we're, we're coming at them. But I, I, bottom line is it's, it's uh, skill and, uh, you know, just the, the overall uh, group of, um, I won't say talent, just the, performance as a group that uh, they're struggling with and it just so happens that their home record is not uh, what it should be and uh, tough to put your finger on one thing. It's a good point you make about the fans though, Rick, is you know, back in the glory days in the 70s or at the Forum, if the Canes were tied in the third period, they'd be getting booed, right? Or is that any game? Whereas now, like the fans now are so behind this team and the rebuild, like there's games they're down 3 nothing in the third period and instead of fans booing them, they start the go Habs go chant where they start trying to fire up the team. So I think it shows just, I mean, so much of this fan base has never experienced the Stanley Cup, right? Or very few playoff wins. But I think fans have bought into the rebuild, and they're behind, they're behind this team. Like, it's, I, there's not many times this year that I can remember the Canes being booed on their home ice. Maybe on the power. But what I think it is, too, is that, you know, the Canadians are finally being transparent about it, that they're like, like before you couldn't say the word rebuild. It was retool or they had every sort of synonym for uh, <laughs> rebuild that they would use. But they're being transparent. You know, we're going to have some difficult years and hopefully it will pay off. And I think the fan base appreciates that rather than sort of being sold uh, like, you know, a patch job that they're doing with the hopes that somehow they can squeak into the playoffs. Yeah, and the, and the effort levels there too, right? You're right. People pay a lot of money to go to these games. And the least you expect is for the players to play hard, right? Even if they're they're not good enough to win, you want them to play hard. And, and that's since Marty St. Louis has taken over this team, they they compete. They play, play hard. They're just not good enough yet to win a lot of games. And, at, and you know, at the, old, at the old forum, we knew very well that we didn't win the night before because the security guards wouldn't dare even look at us or smile at us <laughs> or do anything for us because uh, we lost the game so it's uh, it's it's a different mentality and but it's it's go, it's going the right way uh, you know for all these all these kids uh, what do you guys make of uh, coach Martin St. Louis dropping Brendan Gallagher down to the fourth line is just the evolution of a player that's uh, played quite a few hard years in the NHL Rick well I think we've talked about his situation you know a number of times and you know he got things going a little bit uh, but he just can't maintain it, and it's 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 a it's a tough situation to see a guy that that's had success before and see some of his uh, his level of play deteriorate to the point where he can't really uh, do what he did before. And uh, you know, he's the first one to probably sense it and know it. And the bottom line here is, you know, they're trying to uh, put his Martin St. Louis put his group in a situation to have some success as far as combinations go and obviously feels that uh, Brendan is, is better off uh, there on the fourth line and moving other guys around for the other, uh, the other three lines. So no, it's not a, not a great, great situation for him, but it's what it is. And uh, I think he realized that. And um, I think that when we watch some of the things that he does do as much as he cares, it's just uh, not happening for him. 
Yeah, I spoke with Gallagher about this after practice on Tuesday about being sent down to the fourth line. And, you know, he's a great team guy, but he's also a pride. He's a lot of pride, right, in himself. And he said he's not happy about it. He wouldn't want him to be happy about it. And he said it's just another challenge for him now to prove that he's not a fourth liner, that he should be playing higher up. And, you know, earlier in the season, he was playing really well when he was on that veteran line with Monaghan and Pearson. And since then, he's been bounced around different lines here and there. I think that's difficult for him. And I think I've said this before on this show. I think when... Mark Bergevin let Philip Deneau get away. I think he lost two players. Brandon Gallagher has not been the same player without Philip Deneau. I mean, Deneau and Gallagher and Tatar, that was one of the best, or not the best, five-on-five line in the NHL for a period. And I think with Gallagher, he's just, he hasn't, they haven't been able to find the line mates that he clicks with. It used to be when he was younger, whatever line wasn't working, the coach would put Gallagher on it, and that would sort of fix the line, right, with his effort and his work level and whatnot. But he's at a point now where he needs other guys to help him and I don't think they've found that combination. Again, they had it with Monaghan and Pearson. That's not happening again now with Monaghan uh, playing in Winnipeg. But I think it's for, I think Brendan's frustrated, I think, and it, just trying to find a comfort zone with guys he can play with. And uh, being on the fourth line, as I said, he's not happy about it. You wouldn't expect him to be. But I also understand why Marty St. Louis put him there. Yeah, it makes sense based on what he's accomplished this season. I think there's also a, a part of it that is. I think the coaching staff knows that they can put Gallagher on any line and the line won't get totally caved in. He does still push the puck up the ice relatively well. Uh, he's still one of the Canadians leaders in terms of their on ice shot attempt differential, scoring chance differentials, that kind of stuff. So he gets chances. He's just not able to finish routinely anymore. And he's not been surrounded by teammates who can finish on the, the rebounds that he creates or the, the passes that he creates. I I'm not, ready to throw in the towel on Gallagher yet uh, as a useful player. I do think that he's been wildly unlucky this year in terms of on ice shooting percentage and save percentage. Uh, If you look at his actual impact in the game in terms of shot attempts, scoring chances, expected goals, all that stuff, it's all still in the positives, but the goals have not gone his way at all. And sometimes you can't control that, right? Sometimes it's something that you're doing wrong, but I, I think it's difficult to blame one guy for the performance of, five guys on the ice all the time, even if it's been a a long run here. I I think he's going to move up the lineup uh, in short order as they try to figure out what works uh, in this last bit of the season here. But overall, I'm not really concerned about Brendan Gallagher because I think he's a known quantity. You can kind of put him out there and he's not getting top line minutes anyway. It's only been a handful of times this season where he's gotten over 15 minutes of ice time. So I think the coaching staff knows that he's at his absolute best when he has no energy at the end of every shift and he's playing 12 to 14 minutes a night. And sometimes that means he's going to be on the fourth line. Sometimes it's the third line. And frankly, when he was on the fourth line, I thought the the actual fourth line on the team in terms of performance was the Evans Anderson and Pearson line. That line was just terrible. So even though Gallagher was playing on the fourth line, he didn't seem like a fourth liner. No, I mean, he was he was underpaid as a 30-goal scorer, and he's overpaid now, obviously. But the thing with Brendan Gallagher that will never change, the effort level, compete level is always going to be there. Like he's going to give you everything he has every shift he's on the ice, but he doesn't have what he used to have you know, four or five years ago. Uh, since Alex Newhook came back from his injury, what have you made of his performance so far? Uh, so you are speaking about it a little bit before. Uh, what, what's your take on it? Well, he hasn't lost the speed. I mean, that's right from day one of training camp when I watched him. The speed and his work ethic. We were just talking about that with Gallagher. Like He has a Gallagher-like work ethic. He works his butt off every time he's on the ice. And and that's really impressive to me for a really a skilled guy uh, like that and with the speed. He, he's a good. He's a, just a really good hockey player. He's really impressed me since he's come here. And I understand why Kent Hughes was willing to give up what he gave up to get him. You know, and really, 28 games played, uh, it's got 15 points, eight goals. Um, you know, he's uh, he brings a nice element to the team. Uh, you know, Stu touched on his speed. He seems to really want to compete, and he does. And uh, he brings a, a really nice element to that uh, that position with his, his ability to get up the ice, get in on the forecheck. And uh, he seems to be, uh, you know, motivated to uh, – to, to do a good job and it's it's nice to see because um, he was playing well before he got uh, hurt and now he's kind of picking up and, and pushing hard to see if he can uh, contribute uh, the best he can in the final stretch. 
it's been fun watching him come back to the game because, you know, he's coming back and the, the best three players on the team in terms of forwards are all on one line. So he doesn't have a lot to work with. And I think he's had a lot of really great chances. Maybe his timing is a little bit off. He had a lot of time away from the game. He'll get that back. He scored in his last game, but he is generating a lot of scoring chances. And I'm frankly shocked at how good he's looked at the power play in Monaghan's spot. He fit in there so seamlessly. I did not expect that at all. So there's a lot of facets to his game that we've been in 28 short games treated to this season. He, Like Stu said, he's got an endless motor in terms of his work ethic and his speed in small spaces is just incredible. I think uh, if Joshua Waugh sticks for the rest of the season, I'd like to see them continue to develop some more chemistry. There's something there. You know, I, the fact that he's forced to play center now as well, where he struggled earlier in the season and now he's not struggling as much, also a good sign. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Kent Hughes ahead of this year's draft use that second first round pick and maybe package it with something to try and get another Alex Newhook type player. And I was talking with Newhook the other day about with the Kirby Doc situation. And, you know, they played together a little bit before. Well, Doc played two games, so they didn't play together that much. But they had some time together. And, you know, it looks like the number one line is set now with Suzuki, Caulfield, and Slavkovsky. And I mentioned uh, to Newhook, like, do you anticipate – I know they're still focused on this season, but next season do you anticipate yourself being part of the second line with Doc? And he said, yeah, that's something you could see. He says, you know, one's a left-hand shot, one's a right-hand shot, so they would both be able to take face-offs on their strong sides. He says, I think my speed and his size together would be a good combination. So that's something for Canes fans looking ahead to next season. The question is, who's the third guy on that line, right? That, that's going to be your, your second line is going to be mm-hmm. Doc Newhook and who. So that's something I think that Marty St. Louis for the rest of the season uh, might be a little bit of an addition for that as he puts different players uh, with Newhook to see uh, who might work well with him. Do you see Raphael Harvey Pinard having a future with the Montreal Canadiens, Andrew? Yes, I absolutely do. I know it's been a tough season for him in terms of production, but again, when you look at all the little things that he does, I think he's a very good player. I I think he's a player who can play on all four lines when you need him to. He doesn't seem to be deterred by being moved down the lineup. He's a fantastic penalty killer. I think he's the best penalty killing forward on the Montreal Canadiens. He's just such a versatile player. He does so many little things well. He's just got to find a way to stay healthy. And this hasn't been something that's plagued him uh, it, throughout the rest of his uh, professional career. It's just been this year. He just cannot stay healthy and the puck won't go in for him. So it's been a nightmare year for him, but I 100% believe he's part of the 12 forwards next season. Well, I mean, look at 14 goals in 34 games last year. And then, you know, starting off this year, I thought would be a real long shot. He could do nothing wrong offensively. Everything, you know, that he touched was going the right way. And, you know, how quickly things change and, you know, throw injuries into there. And, you know, a, a kid that, that that tries, that works hard and, and tries to compete. Um, is he going to be part of the uh, the picture moving forward? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure about that. Uh, I, I mean, I like him. But uh, I'm not sure whether or not he's going to be able to uh, pick up where he had left off even last year, even close to it. And, uh, you know, if you want to use him, obviously, as a a penalty killer or a a guy that works hard, those kind of guys you can find, uh, you know, just about anywhere. Yeah, I mean, last season, everything went right for him, right? It's like everything he shot went in. But you go back, I mean, there's reasons why he was a seventh round draft pick, right? He wasn't a top prospect. Uh, part of me wonders if he's maybe like the next Charles Hudon, that guy who mm-hmm. really good in the AHL and can look good at times in the NHL, but not consistent enough. Um, so to me, that's a concern. Um, you know, Ken Hughes sent him a two-year contract. I think it's $1 million a year. It's not a, not a lot of money. Uh, but again, like with Gallagher, the work ethic is always there with him. I mean, when he was playing Laval, they called him Lavalager. Um, so the work ethic's always there. But again, my concern is, is, is he going to be able to be a productive offensive player in the NHL or is he going to end up being another Charles Udall? That's a really good uh, comparison, uh, Stu, with the Charles Udall. Like, really, there's just something missing, you know, from keeping him being, you know, a regular NHLer. But, of course, the injuries also don't really help. Uh, Now, the next player that I want to know if you think that will be here uh, next year with the Canadians, I screw up his name every single time, Jesse (laughs) Yulanen. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay, because every time I say it, I think I'm saying it wrong. So, perfect. 
<laughs> Good to remember for next time. Rick, what do you think? Do you think he'll be with the Canadians next year? I'll keep it simple and call, call him Jesse. <laughs> and uh, should be okay with that. But no, this this kid, you know, I, I've spoken before about him, a, a, a kid that, you know, he tries to do something every time he's on the ice, which isn't often. And for whatever reason, he doesn't seem to be uh, well liked by the, the coaching staff to, you know, give to be given more opportunity. But from a, a skill level, I don't mind him. I... I like what he brings. He can skate. He can shoot. We've seen him uh, do some really nice moves uh, with with good hands on the uh, uh, on shootouts and stuff. And he just hasn't had a fair uh, shake as far as you know, uh, be given an opportunity to to play uh, some minutes and and see what exactly he can do. So tough tough uh, decision uh, on him, uh, but I, I don't mind him. Uh, I wish I could see more of him. Yeah, I think the biggest impediment to Jesse Ulan and being used a bit more, and this is, it sounds like bullying at this point, but it's Josh Anderson. Uh, the Canadians are continually trying to get Josh Anderson going, trying to find a line that works for him. It's been three years trying to find something to make Josh Anderson be more than what he shows on the ice, but more than what he shows in the stat sheet. It has not worked. Uh, I, I do think the organization made a pretty big mistake in not moving Josh Anderson when they had offers for him around the time that Sla uh, Slavkovsky was drafted. Between him and Gallagher, it's like the one area where there's a lot of vets, where he has to overtake them. And every small chance that Ulanin has had to play on one of those lines with a little bit more talent, it hasn't worked out for him in, in very short sample sizes. And he's been the one guy that they haven't really been patient with. It's, it's unfortunate. I'd like to see what he can do. He strikes me as a guy that will go to a team like Tampa Bay and end up being a pretty good two-way forward for them. And I, I just don't see it happening here just based on age, the amount of players that are going to be trying to break into the lineup in short order, and the players who are ahead of him on the organizational depth chart. Yeah, you, uh, you guys know I've been a big defender of Josh Anderson in the past. I don't know what's going on with him this season. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't notice him on the ice a lot of nights. So I think in, you're right, Andrew, in hindsight now, they might have missed their opportunity when teams were interested in him because I can't imagine there's a ton of interest right now. But with Ulan, you know, he scored two goals November 16th against Vegas, and he hasn't scored since. You know, he's got 33 games without scoring a goal. And that's, even if you're on the fourth line or whatever you're playing with, a player with that skill level or what we seem seems to have that skill level, like, you got to put the puck in the net when you get some chances and it's just not happening for him. And, you know, we were talking about Harvey Pinard before, like, is he one of those guys who just can't produce offensively at the NHL level? There's a lot of guys like that, right? It's like in baseball, a guy who can hit 300 in triple A and then can't hit major league pitching. It's a big jump. So it's at this point, you know, they signed him to a one year contract. Uh, at the end of, I think he's a restricted free agent at the end of the season. Um, I'm not sure. The answer to my question is, yeah, I really, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, do they, I can't imagine them offering him more than a one-year contract again. Um, so that's one of those things. Like, I really, I'm not sure if they, what, if the Canes have seen enough in them that they think there's something moving forward. But if I had to bet, I would say that he doesn't have much of a future. Well, that's it for us this week on Hockey Inside Out. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for your sharing your thoughts on the Canadians this week. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out YouTube channel. Go to montrealgazette.com slash newsletters to sign up for the Hockey Inside Out newsletter. And of course, go to hockey, hockeyinsideout.com for all your daily Habs coverage.